Okay. So, hello everyone and good evening. Welcome to this evening's edition of Cosmos from Your Couch. My name is Dr. Karthik Ayer and I am excited to be talking with you about some of the work that I do. Uh, I have the YouTube chat window open beside me, so I will be happy to take any questions during the talk. There is a bit of a lag on YouTube, so there's, there's a, a span of about 30 seconds between when I say something and when uh, it shows up. So if I'm delayed in getting to any of your questions, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well. And I hope that you're interested in hearing about distant galaxies and how we figure out what their properties are and how we uh, figure out what kind of lives they've been living. So this work that I'm going to be talking about today has been done in collaboration with many, many people, some of whom I've tried to list over here. And it really would be impossible without all of them. So my deep abiding thanks for the productive collaborative atmosphere that has allowed me to do this kind of exciting science. All right, so let's jump in. Uh, and let me tell you a bit about myself. So my name is Dr. Karthik Ayer, and I work as a Dunlop postdoctoral fellow at the Dunlop Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics at U of T. And what a postdoctoral fellow is, is a, a position that falls somewhere between being a graduate student working on their PhD and a faculty who's taking students of their own and doing research as part of a university environment. So being a postdoc, is a sort of uh, halfway point that gives me the benefits of both being a student and being a faculty without uh, a lot of the drawbacks that come with either. So it's really exciting. And as a postdoctoral fellow over here, I work on galaxy evolution. So galaxy evolution is the field of studying galaxies and trying to figure out how they evolve. One key component of doing this is figuring out how the galaxies are forming their stars. And it's really interesting because we live in a galaxy of our own called the Milky Way. And this is not something I'm going to be talking about much, but there is another Cosmos from Your Couch by Dr. Gwendolyn Eady next week that's going to go into a deep dive about the Milky Way. So the work I do is called extragalactic astronomy because it's looking at the behavior and the nature of galaxies that are outside our own. And it's trying to figure out how they are evolving over time. And galaxies are interesting objects to study because we can imagine them to be cosmic citizens where we are trying to learn more about the universe by studying how galaxies were behaving at different times. For example, when the universe was much younger than it was today versus how it is now. And you can think of this in a manner similar to people who study human civilization across time, right? So human civilization in pre-industrial times was different from uh, civilization after the invention of the steam engine or civilization even recently has changed dramatically after say computers were invented. So we can look at snapshots of human civilization across time and then try to connect all of these to make a consistent picture of how humans have evolved to be what we are now. And the same way we do this with distant galaxies. So it's really fun. And another interesting thing is that unlike experiments that we do here on earth, galaxies are enormous distant objects and we cannot directly interact with them. The only thing we can see is the light from these distant galaxies and figuring out all of their properties just from this light is a very interesting problem in its own right. So this talk is going to be as much a story about light as it's going to be about galaxies. This is something you'll see later on. So what are galaxies? I've said the word about 20 times now. Galaxies are cosmic structures that are made up of stars and other things like gas that collapses to form stars and dark matter. And 
for distant galaxies, we can't really see all of this, but for nearby galaxies, we are actually able to perform detailed observations with our telescopes that show us the nature of these things. And using this information, we can run giant computer simulations uh, that take the universe at a very young age and put in equations for physics and all the building blocks of which galaxies are made of, and then let it evolve over time to see what we get. And so in this sort of simulation, uh, this one's something called Illustrious, and you can go explore this yourself at this website. So in this simulation, the snapshot that I'm showing you, each point is a galaxy. And so it evolves this very large box in which uh, you can see how the box evolves over time and how the galaxies that are in this box evolve over time. And uh, since this is a simulation, we have access to more things than just how galaxies look when we observe them. So apart from the light that comes from the stars, you can sort of take off your observable light spectacles. And maybe if you had a pair of spectacles that allowed you to see dark matter, you could wear them and you would see the universe looks quite different from how it does in ordinary light. And so in this dark matter view, you see that each galaxy has a much larger radius of dark matter around it. And this is because there's usually a lot more dark matter in galaxies than there is regular stars and stellar stuff. So this ratio can be anywhere between 10 times to 100 times, depending on how many stars are in the galaxy. And you can see that galaxies that actually look quite distinct, like these, these galaxies don't look like they have anything in common, apart from just being sort of close to each other looks like they're part of the same overall dark matter halo in, in this image. So it paints a very different picture and it allows us to sometimes understand why galaxies interact and how they do this. You can also switch to seeing a view of what the gas in these galaxies is doing. And you can see that uh, objects, for example, over here that don't seem to be doing much in, when you look at them in dark matter or in visible light, show these giant outflows, for example, which could probably be happening because of uh, exploding stars and causing supernovae that blow the gas out of these galaxies. So, the, so there's a lot of complex stuff going on with galaxies and it's, it's a challenge and a pleasure to under, try to understand them. And if you're thinking that you know, these are small objects that we can study and understand the dynamics. And here really, like some of these galaxies look tiny, right? Because uh, they're so small relative to anything on the scale of this figure. If we switch to, uh, if we actually look at galaxies, we see that they are huge in terms of both uh, size and every conceivable quantity about them, like the number of stars they might contain. So to give you a sense of what this number is, because it takes me uh, a lot of mental athletics to sort of get to a point where I can even parse this number, which is the size of the galaxy. Let's start off from a scale where you have a human who's about a meter tall and go up by something that's 60 times longer, which is the size of an airplane. If we go up by another five times, we reach the, the height of the Eiffel Tower. Now, if we, if we jump from there to say a person who runs a marathon, then that person covers a distance of around 42 kilometers, which is a few times bigger than this. And if this person runs a marathon around a hundred times, from across the, the breadth of Canada, then he would end up covering the 5,000 odd kilometers that that breadth consists of. If you jump up from there and you look at the size of the earth, it's about two times this breadth. Uh, this is just the diameter, by the way, not the circumference. And now we have been slowly building up in, in size, but let's take a giant jump up to the size of our solar system. So in comparison to all of these units, this is just inconceivably large, right? It's 143 billion kilometers wide. And now if we compare this to the size of our galaxy, which is about a billion, billion kilometers wide, 
then you see that the scale is simply something that we don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and again, these are not the biggest things in the universe. So coming back to the scale ladder, you have planets and we live on the earth, which is the third planet in the solar system. Uh, these are small compared to stellar neighborhoods. And those are com small compared to the sizes of galaxies, which are small compared to the size of the known universe. So there's a lot of jumping up in scales going on here. And every time we jump up a scale, the mechanics of what happened can get more complicated just because of the larger number of things involved. So when we think of a galaxy, this is sort of the picture that we imagine of uh, the spiral arms with a center and you can see stars everywhere. Those are usually the more bright stars in, in these galaxies. Uh, but this is not the only way a galaxy may look like. So you could also have a galaxy that looks like an interacting system or just something very irregular in shape. Or you could have a galaxy that looks elliptical with no discernible structure like these nice looking spiral arms. Oh, my computer died, let me... Okay, and uh, in, in addition to that, you can also have all of these really nice looking galaxies that show completely bizarre shapes. And here's another example of Andromeda, which is one of the galaxies closest to us, uh, which is a nice looking spiral. And so there's this incredible diversity in how galaxies look. And it becomes a very interesting question to think about this because we look at all of these galaxies around us and we're like, where does this incredible diversity come from, right? Because after all, galaxies are all made out of the same starting materials, right? When the Big Bang happened uh, a few billion years after, uh, a few million years after that, you had uh, the first elements starting to form, and uh, these things essentially form out of the same primordial set of elements. And in addition to that, they also experience the same set of forces. So the strong and weak uh, nuclear forces, electromagnetism, and gravity. And it's interesting to think of how starting from similar starting points in experiencing the same forces, where do you get this diversity between all the galaxies? Uh, okay, so there's a question from YouTube. What allows for the dark matter view, seeing as we do not know what dark matter is? So simulations of dark matter, which is sort of what you saw here, are essentially taking very simplified properties of the dark matter as we know it from local observations and from our theory of how the universe started. And so when these simulations take these simplified assumptions, they can try to see if they reproduce within this paradigm galaxies that look similar to ours. And so that's the way these simulations are sort of uh, simulating dark matter. So these dark matter particles in the simulation are essentially large particles that have uh, masses that are tens of, tens of millions of times the mass of our sun. And they try to figure out uh, acting just under gravity, how do these particles evolve? So stars do a lot of things, like they grow and they age and they die, but the dark matter particles don't do that. They experience only gravity. So that's what gives us this dark matter view. And it's been very remarkably consistent with all the local observations that we have so far. Uh, the second question was, if dark matter surrounds a galaxy, why does it not end up pulling it apart? So dark matter experiences gravity, right? And because of this, it sort of clumps together. And so if there's a lot of dark matter in a galaxy, it actually does the opposite. It doesn't pull it apart. It ends up holding it together. Sometimes even in the face of other things like a violent galaxy merger. So when two galaxies come together and collide, it might be stabilized by the dark matter surrounding it. All right, so let's come back to the question we set up. So this is saying that in the world around us, we see this incredible diversity around galaxies. 
and if everything starts from basically the same point how do they look so different and solving this mystery is sort of uh, a rewarding quest for anyone doing galaxy evolution and it needs some setup so we're going to spend some time doing this setup and then we're going to uh, come back to this question later on in the talk so here's how the setup happens the first question is how do we observe galaxies for the longest time uh, we thought galaxies were just indistinct blobs on the sky and we didn't really know that they were things that are outside our milky way and that they're distant objects on of their own so these days we have telescopes both on the ground uh, some of the biggest best telescopes in the world they really exist all over the world but uh, they are found wherever you have good viewing conditions so there's how telescopes in hawaii in chile in south africa in spain and all of these telescopes uh, have exquisite uh, instruments that allow us to see distant objects the issue is that sometimes telescopes uh, aren't able to see things for example because of bad weather and sometimes they're not able to see things because of uh, our atmosphere reflecting a certain uh, wavelength of light so it's really hard to build in infrared instruments for example because our atmosphere doesn't let a lot of infrared light through and so to deal with this problem of having an atmosphere we started building and sending telescopes in space so a few notable examples of this are the hubble and the spitzer space telescopes as well as the newer instruments like tess and the upcoming james webb space telescope so all of these telescopes allow us to observe distant galaxies with unparalleled precision this is something that would have been unthinkable uh, 30 years ago for example before we launched hubble so it's it's really a testament to human ingenuity that we thought galaxies were interesting and then we started making these instruments that we could send into space to observe them so having uh, built these telescopes and sent them into space and gotten back observations what do we do how do we understand how galaxies are evolving uh, there's many different ways to do it but one of the more uh powerful ways of figuring out how galaxies on average evolve instead of looking at single samples of galaxies is to do something called a galaxy survey and this is basically conducting a census of galaxies so a galaxy survey uh looks at a very large population of galaxies a representative population of galaxies and asks each galaxy questions the way a regular census would ask how many people live in this house what are the ages of the people uh, the same way a galaxy survey would ask how for each galaxy how far away is the galaxy how many stars does it have what's the rate at which it's forming new stars how old is it and questions like this and we'll see later on what we get by asking these questions but the first thing you need to do as a scientist is figure out how to answer each of these questions so let's take some time and look into that the first question is how far away are galaxies and this is usually summarized in the astronomy literature by a single word called redshift especially when you're talking about distant galaxies so the word is redshift and it's denoted by the letter z and before going into what redshift is we first need to talk briefly about some properties of light so there's two things about light that i want you to remember as we go through the rest of this talk one is that light is a wave and therefore it has all the properties that waves have for example a wavelength or a frequency and a wavelength is basically the length that one full oscillation of this wave would describe light also has a very wide range of different wavelengths that we see it over so normally our eyes can perceive only the visible portion which is a very small part of all the ranges that we actually see light in so if you go to shorter wavelengths than visible you go into the ultraviolet also called the uv and you'll notice that that's closest to like the blue or violet portions of this visible spectrum 
Similarly, if you go to longer wavelengths, uh, you go into the infrared, which is close to this red portion of the spectrum. So if during the later part of the talk, I say anything to do with red or anything to do with blue, uh, please know that I'm talking about either going to shorter wavelengths or going to longer wavelengths. So in the shorter wavelengths, you have light that increasingly becomes of higher and higher energies going to X-rays and gamma rays. And in the longer wavelengths, you have things like infrared, microwave, and radio waves. So all of these are different types of light, right? And uh, so that's one point, that light has a wavelength and this wavelength changes. And the second point is that light has a constant speed. And we'll see where that is important later on in this talk. So for now, just keep in mind the wavelength. So with this information, we want to understand what redshift is. When we see light coming from distant objects, suppose it has some intrinsic wavelength shown here as the yellow wave. We, uh, this, this light travels from the distant object for a very long amount of time and then comes and falls into our telescopes where we see it. But if this object appears to be moving toward us, then the wavelength of this light gets compressed towards shorter wavelengths. And so we say that the light is blue shifted. In the same way, if the object appears to be moving away from us, the wavelength gets shifted to longer wavelengths and uh, it becomes shifted to redder wavelengths. So, so shifting to bluer wavelengths is called blue shifting and shifting to redder wavelengths is called red shifting. And it doesn't, so this is one part of the picture. And if, to understand this, one of the best analogies is to think of whether uh, a fire truck, say with its siren blaring, is coming towards you or going away from you. So if it's coming towards you, its pitch is sharply rising and it's going and if it's going away from you, you see its pitch descending. So the sort of effect of the pitch increasing or decreasing is same uh, is similar to the way uh, blue shift and red shift work because sound is also a wave. Uh, okay, so there's a couple more questions on YouTube. One is, can galaxies grow larger or smaller? Absolutely, and we will talk about this. Uh, and the second is, is dark matter just old burned out stars? So that's not quite true because dark matter is fundamentally different from all the things that make up stars because it only interacts via gravity, whereas the things that make up stars can also interact via other forces. All right, so light from galaxies that's coming towards us is blue shifted and light that's uh, coming from galaxies that are going away is red shifted. Taking that one piece of information along with something called Hubble's law, gives us the statement that uh, because the universe is expanding, galaxies that are far away seem to be moving away from us at faster speeds. So this means that light that's coming away from a distant galaxy is going to be redshifted a lot more than light that's coming from a relatively nearby galaxy. And therefore, figuring out what the redshift is for any given galaxy gives you a very precise estimate of how far away this galaxy is. So this is how we answer question one, which is how far away is a galaxy. We look at light from the galaxy, we figure out how much it has been redshifted, and that actually gives us an estimate of uh, how far away the galaxy is. And again, uh, it's not as if galaxies are actually moving away from us. It just seems that way because the universe is expanding. So we have answered question one. Uh, questions two and three were how many stars does a galaxy have? And what is the rate at which new stars are being found by a galaxy? And the way we do this, the way we find out these two quantities is by doing something called SED fitting, where SED stands for spectral energy distribution, which is a fancy way of saying what is the brightness of a galaxy at different wavelengths. So remember we said that light has a range of wavelengths. It turns out that if you see the same galaxy at all of these different wavelengths, they end up looking quite different. And this is really interesting because it tells us that different 
objects that make up the galaxy maybe emit light at different wavelengths so for example you're looking at uh, the same galaxy in the x ray in the ultraviolet in the visible or in at longer wavelengths in the infrared or at the radio and you can see that uh, the emission in the radio looks quite different and we know now that this is because it's mostly tracing the gas as opposed to the ultraviolet view which is mostly tracing young stars so what we would like to do is sort of combine observations from all of these different instruments so chandra galax at the hubble space telescope spitzer they're all telescopes so we want to combine data that's coming from all of these different instruments and try to come up with one picture of how bright the galaxy is as a function of wavelength and before going further it is impossible to talk about sed fitting without mentioning beatrice tinsley who laid the foundations for this sort of work uh, in the 70s to 80s all the way from her phd thesis up until 1981 when she unfortunately died so how does this work let's try an example where we look at a single galaxy in these three instruments so galax again looks at ultraviolet wavelengths which is towards the bluer end of the spectrum uh, the hubble space telescope looks at uh, wavelengths that that are visible to us and the spitzer space telescope looks at infrared wavelengths so imagine if you were uh, an animal like a python you might be able to see how the galaxy looks here and that's towards redder wavelengths so when we are looking at uh, galaxies across these wavelengths we can sort of figure out how bright the galaxy is as a function of wavelength and that gives us this curve which is the galaxy's sed or spectral energy distribution and now this curve i say is what's going to hold the key to unlocking how many stars a galaxy has and this might be confusing because this curve doesn't really look like anything right it's just these random set of bumps and wiggles so how do we figure out using this how many stars a galaxy has and we are able to do this because the lifetime of a star is set by how much mass it has so the more massive a star is the more the gravitational pressure at its center so it's going to burn through its fuel more quickly and therefore it will have a shorter lifetime because it's going through its fuel more quickly but because it's also burning a lot of fuel at every unit of time it's also going to have a higher temperature and therefore it will have a higher energy which means that it will show up in the bluer parts of an sed so as an approximation things that look blue are going to be young so let's just go with that and then if we start looking at which portion of this galaxy's sed is coming from the youngest stars we see that it dominates at the wavelengths where the light is blue similarly if we look at intermediate age stars its contribution dominates at wavelengths that are somewhere between blue and red and as we go to older stars uh the peak in a galaxy's sed from these older stars happens at the longest reddest wavelengths so what this allows us to do this knowledge of how stellar lifetimes behave allows us to take a galaxy's sed and decompose it into break it down into contributions that come from young stars from intermediate age stars and from older stars right so when we do this we can actually start interpreting the sed because now we can say okay i know how much light is coming from the youngest stars i know how much light is coming from stars that are of intermediate age and i know how much light is coming from the older stars so if i want to now find the number of young stars all i need to do is say how much light do i expect from one young star and if i divide the total observed amount of light from all the young stars by the amount of light i expect from one young star i can estimate the number of young stars right so this is amazing because now we can start talking about the number of stars in this galaxy and we can see, we can do the same thing with the other two populations as well so we can we can figure out how many intermediate age stars are and how many old stars there are in this galaxy and so once we have done this we can just add all of those up to figure out what the total number of stars in a galaxy is 
So this is how we answer question number two. Question number three, the rate at which a galaxy is forming new stars can also be answered by basically the same framework. Except now the only thing you're doing is you take the number of young stars and you divide that by the lifetime of young stars to find out the rate at which these young stars are being produced. So this allows you to answer questions two and three. So at this point, we have figured out, given a distant galaxy, how with just its light, we can figure out how far away it is. We can figure out how many stars it has. And we can figure out at what rate it's making new stars. And this is amazing because this combined with another fascinating property of light allows you to figure out how galaxies are evolving across time. And the second fascinating point about light is going to allow us to see the universe as if we were looking through a time machine. So uh, there's a question that says SEDs must be adjusted for the expansion of the universe and distance from the Earth. Uh, and the answer is absolutely. So there's a distance, uh, there's a difference between how bright an object is and how bright it appears to us. And as something grows farther and farther away from us, it's going to look fainter and fainter. So when we figure out the redshift of a galaxy, we know how far away it is. And we can use that to adjust for how much uh, its actual brightness is rather than the brightness that we see. So yes, that's a great question. Thank you. All right, onwards. Let's talk about the universe at different ages. So here we use the second uh, property of light that I brought up, which is that light travels at a constant speed. Light travels at the speed of light, right? And uh, this is going to be very useful to us. And I just want to mention that here, the colors that I'm showing are no longer related to redshift. Uh, I'm showing the redshift as a number at the bottom. So the colors are purely, say, different populations of galaxies that we are studying. Uh, and, and this increasing redshift basically says that they're at increasing distances to us. Okay, so when we see these distant objects that essentially look like points now uh, through our telescope, we are seeing the light that has been traveling for a very long time from these objects until it gets to us. And now because light travels at a constant pace, the light has to leave that point earlier at some point to get to us. So as an example, if you see uh, light from a planet that's a hundred light years away, then that is going to, that planet is going to be in, so if that planet was a mirror to us, it's going to appear to be in the 1920s instead of now, right? We are, it, because the light's going to take a hundred years to travel from there to here. So if we see uh, a planet just like Earth from about 65 million light years away, then when the light reaches us and when we observe it, we'll still see dinosaurs on the surface of that planet and things like that. So light has to travel for greater and greater dist the distances and it takes a greater amount of time for light from these increasingly distant objects to get to us. And as it does this, uh, we essentially get to see those objects as they were when they were younger. So let's, let's actually take these distances and turn them into time. So this actually gives us an idea of, of how incredibly distant they are because a redshift of 0.5 doesn't seem like much, right? But then when you see the actual amounts of times, the light from a redshift of half object has to travel for 5 billion years before it reaches us. And if you're having trouble imagining what 5 billion years is, imagine what you would do if you had $5 billion. It's a lot of time. The same way an object from a redshift of one has to travel for about 8 billion years to reach us. And since the universe itself was born only about 13.7 billion years ago, uh, this means that as we see galaxies at a redshift of one, we are seeing all of those galaxies as it was when the universe was only 6 billion years old. If we see galaxies at redshift two, 
we're seeing those galaxies only at, at, when the universe was three billion years old. So the universe was quite young uh, at redshift two. And when we see light from these redshift two galaxies, we are able to get a snapshot of the universe at that point. The same thing's true for redshift one and for redshift point five. So now these, these are still individual examples of galaxies, but what we see with our galaxy sensors is a whole cross section of all the galaxies that were present in the universe at that point. So now what we are able to do is we are able to see all the galaxies say at a redshift one, all the galaxies at a redshift of half, all the galaxies at a redshift of two. And we are not only able to see them, we are also able to measure their properties like the number of stars they have and the rate at which they're forming stars. So we essentially are able to take a census of the universe across time, enabled by our telescopes that effectively let us see into the past. And so this is the incredibly powerful data that we're going to use to create our theories of how galaxies are evolving. Right? And as, as the question uh, said, like as, as we get farther away, uh, as we look at more and more distant objects, the light from these objects does get fainter and fainter. So you need telescopes that have increasingly high sensitivities to be able to look at objects that are farther away. So ground-based observatories were only able to go up to a certain redshift and after that the objects got too faint for us to observe. Once we started making telescopes that could go into space, we started looking at uh, objects that came farther and farther away, uh, from, who, from whom the light came from farther and farther away. And we we're able to use the increased sensitivity of these telescopes to look at these distant objects. So the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be one of the most exquisite instruments that we build and send into space when it launches. And it's going to be able to see incredibly far, almost up to a redshift of 20 when the universe was only about 200 billion years old. So in this graph, this end is when the Big Bang happened and this end is the present universe. So you can see how galaxies are actually evolving over time. Uh, and yes, they actually do increase in the number of stars and they increase in sizes and all of their other properties over time as well. And studying how they do this, how they increase in size, how they increase in the number of stars tells us a lot about their general patterns of growth. Okay. Uh, there's a question saying, can white or black holes make galaxies? So this is again a question of scale, right? Uh, some galaxies, including our own, do have central supermassive black holes that can be uh, as heavy as millions to hundreds of millions of times the mass of our own sun. But in comparison to these, the galaxies themselves are uh, sometimes billions to trillions of times the mass of our sun. So in comparison to the size of the galaxy, a black hole is still always tiny. Now there can be some interesting interactions between these central supermassive black holes and the galaxy itself. And we are still trying to figure out what effect it has on the galaxy as a whole. So it's a really interesting question. All right, so at the end of this section, we have figured out how to take observations of galaxies, how to figure out the physical properties of galaxies using these observations, and then how to extend our senses to uh, essentially learning about galaxy properties across time. So from when the universe was young to when it is at, at the stage where we see it now. And one final point that I wanted to make is that all the, all the pictures of galaxies that I've shown you so far have been really pretty. And the kind of data that I deal with on a daily basis looks significantly less pretty than that. So as an example, I'm showing galaxies here from something called the Candles Survey. Uh, and these are galaxies that are anywhere between a redshift of a half to two, sort of the range that I showed in the figure. And they look really hard to see. So this is why studying them at multiple wavelengths is one of the ways of getting the most amount of information out of these distant objects. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Even if you have telescopes that 
have high enough sensitivity to detect light want the resolution for things that are massively far away be too low to get more than a pixel if even that and yes that's an excellent question and it does keep us up at night so uh the resolution is a huge limiting factor for how distant you can see uh and this is something that is constantly being improved in newer instruments that are being built another massive step up in resolution came from the transition to uh space based telescopes so what happens is our own atmosphere is quite turbulent and because of this turbulence observations that we do from ground based telescopes can be significantly limited by uh our ability to resolve through this turbulence so when you send telescopes into space you can resolve things a lot better but even then yes distant objects like the ones i'm showing over here uh do show the effects of poor resolution so you like a lot of these are hardly more than small indistinct blobs and at our current state this is the best that we can do but what we are doing is we are studying the single blob uh at multiple wavelengths and using that to construct an sed and using that sed to figure out its physical properties so even if this were just a point source we would still be able to do all the things that i talked about so far all we need to do is get how bright it is at different wavelengths all right so we have set up our mechanisms we have done our due diligence we figured out how to extract properties from galaxies and how to uh figure out the best way to sort of get the physical properties for a large number of galaxies and using all of this information what can we learn about galaxy evolution the uh best plot like this plot is something that is shown at astrophysics conferences a lot uh of the history of cosmic star formation shows what the rate of uh star formation in the universe was like essentially summing over all galaxies at a given uh age of the universe so if you look at the x axis this is showing redshift going from zero to high numbers a redshift of zero is the present time and as you go to higher and higher numbers you approach the big bang uh and what this is showing is that star formation increased up to a point where it peaked around 10 billion years in the past and ever since it's been declining smoothly so this decline is sort of uh, a a decline by 10 times so at at its epoch of maximum star formation which is sometimes called the cosmic noon galaxies on average were forming 10 times as many stars as they form now so this is a really interesting thing and and some people speculate whether we are in a cosmic autumn or whether it's a cosmic evening but this uh, epoch of somewhere between that shift of 1 to 2 is when a lot of galaxies grew really large and uh, formed most of the stars but this is a sort of broad picture showing you what's happening throughout the age of the universe if we want to learn more about individual galaxies we now look at the rate at which a galaxy is forming stars against the number of stars that a galaxy has and we find a very interesting thing there's this really nice correlation between the number of stars that a galaxy has and the rate at which new stars are being made uh, and so essentially galaxies that have more stars are also forming more stars and this is not a uh, obvious result because you would think that uh, if every galaxy had the same amount of gas with which to make stars uh if it's more massive then it must have, it it could have used up more of its gas having less left over to make new stars so you would actually expect this to be declining but what you see in reality is this interesting increasing correlation between these two quantities and so this leads us to form theories about how ga galaxies get more fuel or how galaxies don't form all of their stars efficiently so they they sort of spread their fuel out over a long time it also helps us take into account things like galaxy mergers since galaxies don't need to always form just by smoothly making new stars uh 
And this is at higher redshifts, right? This is really when the universe was young. But if we come to lower redshifts, we still see this correlation overall. So although it's a bit lower, you remember that at cosmic noon, star formation activity was just higher. So when you come to lower redshifts, you just see overall that this uh, correlation still exists. It's a bit lower. But now you see this really interesting clump of galaxies here that are sort of stopped forming stars. And they're quite massive. So they've built up a lot of mass and they, they don't appear to be forming stars at present. Sorry. So where do these come from? And is there anything special about these galaxies? Going back to my earlier question about explaining the diversity in the galaxy population, if we now look at all of these different types of galaxies that I talked about, we see something really interesting. We see that they lie uh, localized on some parts of this diagram. So these galaxies that aren't forming stars uh, actively seem to mostly be these indistinct elliptical blobs Galaxies that are forming stars actively and lie on this correlation are sometimes uh, disk-like galaxies. They, they have bars sometimes. And galaxies that are significantly above this correlation, uh, which we call star-bursting galaxies, are sometimes star-bursting in the immediate aftermath of an event like a merger or when two galaxies interact. So maybe gas from one galaxy was able to flow into the other and spark star formation, which led to this increase. So now we can start trying to explain this diversity that we see among the galaxy population by talking about their physical properties. And this was a huge step forward because up until now, we didn't know why these look different. Now we are starting to understand why because of the differences in the properties of how actively they're forming stars right now and how many stars they have. Which leads us to ask the question, uh, what happens across time? So because the universe acts like a time machine and we are able to observe galaxy populations when the universe was younger versus when the universe was older, we can now take all of these different observations across time and sort of plot them with time as an additional axis to try to see how the population overall has been evolving. And this allows us to do some really interesting things like try to speculate on how individual types of galaxies evolve over time by connecting these populations. So for example, we can see that there is this quenched population, this population of galaxies that isn't actively forming stars at low redshift. And this population sort of smoothly increases, uh, smoothly decreases and almost disappears when we get to high redshift. So we can look at the rate at which this population is appearing to try to construct the average trajectory of a galaxy that looks uh, like elliptical and sort of not forming stars at, at the present. This also leads us to the question of if we could get all of this from just these two quantities, how many stars they have and what rate they're forming stars at, what happens if we start figuring out even more information from our observations and adding all of that to our theory. So what if we ask additional questions in our senses of how do these galaxies look? Do they look like spirals or bars or do, are they ellipticals? Uh, if we try to figure out how galaxies interact with each other, like what's the rate, how, how long do they interact for? Uh, if we ask the question that do galaxies that, that live in isolation far away from uh, other galaxies, do they evolve differently over time from galaxies that live in crowded spaces? The answer to that is yes. And that's an entire interesting discussion in itself. Uh, and what amount of say heavier elements do these galaxies have? And uh, Dr. Maria Drought gave a excellent talk on astronomical alchemy in an earlier session of Cosmos on your couch. And that talks about this in, in a very different interesting perspective. And finally, the question about do they have central supermassive black holes and is the evolution of the central black hole tied to the evolution of the galaxy at all? So with this, with these new questions, we get even more observations and taking all of these observations in, we can start to 
see these as parts of an even bigger picture. So one such example is the fact that uh, we saw that the the star forming uh, objects that look like disks may, may live in a different part compared to things that look elliptical. And uh, if we try to figure out their full star formation history, so essentially the rate at which the galaxy forms stars on average throughout uh, its lifetime, we see that disks and spheroids that have the same number of stars in them uh, form their stars at very different times. So there's a question that's super on point, which is why does an elliptical galaxy form less stars? So it's not forming less stars overall. It's forming less stars at present. And that's because compared to a disk, which is sort of slowly building up its number of stars over time, and a, a spheroid or an elliptical galaxy formed its stars much earlier in the universe, probably around cosmic noon, and then ever since has been dropping in star formation rate. And why this is happening is an interesting open question. And this is the, it's the topic of active research going on in the field right now. So it's not that they have less stars, they're just forming less stars at present. And there's even some very interesting galaxies where the star formation rate goes down and then comes back up. So these are called rejuvenating galaxies and it's a discovery that's less than 10 years old. So, all of these things are interesting and interacting galaxies, like I said, show a sharp uptick in the star formation rate uh, in the immediate aftermath of maybe when they first came in contact with each other. So looking at all of these different observations sorts of gives us an idea of galaxy evolution in, in this bigger picture where you take all of these factors into account and it also adds a lot more nuance and complexity to any simple theories that we might have had in the past. So the way we explain this observed diversity these days is by making either theories of how galaxies evolve and then talking to people who then write complicated computer simulations where they take these theories and they model galaxies according to them and see how a galaxy population would look then they construct these theories where you, you sort of make assumptions about how galaxies evolve over time. And you then compare them with the observations that you have. And so by doing this, you figure out whether your theory matches the observations or it doesn't. If it matches the observations, that's awesome. But because there are so many observations, there's a likelihood that something's not going to match. Then you take that information, you think about it, you put it back in your theory, and then you write a new simulation that improves on your existing model and then compare with observations again. And you keep doing this until we have uh, a good overall understanding of galaxy evolution. So that's the idea. The, the upshot of all of this is that we can do these large galaxy surveys that look at galaxy populations across time. And we can uh, connect these populations with theories of how galaxies are going to evolve over time to essentially get a whole consistent picture. And in doing so, our current models for how galaxies evolve still contain a lot of things that are unknown or poorly constrained by the current data that we have available to us. So we need more data and we need more theory. And there's a lot of stuff that we know that we currently don't know. And hopefully in the future with better simulations, better theories and better observations, we'll be able to pin down some of these unknowns. So this is the state where we currently are at. And it's, it's really interesting because there's so much left to find out. And there's so much that we're already finding out that we digest and put it into our mental picture of, of galaxy evolution. So, I've been saying V throughout, and because this is because the V is really important when it comes to astrophysics. The community of astrophysicists across the world is global and it's collaborative. And this is because astrophysicists have many different specialties. Some people might be good at building instruments. Some people might be good at 
taking observations. Some scientists might be good at doing pure theory, just working with pen and paper. Some people might be good at computer programming and making these complicated simulations of how galaxies evolve. And some people might be good with the statistics that you need to deal with when you have noisy observations that you get and you need to compare them to theory. So if you're good at any one of these things, you're not going to get a whole lot done if you don't talk to people because it takes a lifetime's worth of study to be good at any of these things. And then when you start talking with people, you pull your strengths together to sort of create this picture of galaxy evolution that I've described. So uh, people end up talking to each other. You, uh, The observers have to collaborate with the people who make the simulations to figure out what's the underlying physics of what's forming stars and galaxies, why some galaxies are long-lived, why some, why, while others are not. Uh, and sometimes you even have to talk with people outside your field. So an astronomer might, for example, have to talk to uh, material science people to figure out how to make telescopes that will survive in space. Uh, Com a person who's writing simulations may need to talk to computer science people to figure out how to make the simulations run faster and be more efficient. So there's a lot of crosstalk and this crosstalk gives rise to new ideas that benefit not only the astrophysics community, but also everything around it. And then we think about, okay, with all of this, what comes next? So there's also one question. Uh, are there many stars isolated in between far from any galaxy? So I wouldn't say many, but there are definitely cases of runaway stars which have escaped the local gravity of their parent galaxies. Uh, but more interestingly, there's also large clouds of gas that lies in these sort of filamentary structures between galaxies. And studying them is really important to constraining better theories of both galaxy evolution, but also dark matter. All right, so what comes next? Uh, we are good at measuring objects. We're good at uh, extracting physical properties from them. And we are writing very complicated simulations to figure out what's the physics that gives rise to these observations. This uh, might seem like a solved picture or a picture that doesn't have any more fun things left to do. But there are still many phenomena in galaxy evolution that still don't have explanations to them. So one question that came up earlier in this talk too was, if there's a central supermassive black hole in a galaxy, uh, how does its evolution tie to the evolution of its parent galaxy? So we do see remarkable influences between the rates at which these supermassive black holes and their parent galaxies grow together. So it's really uh, interesting to try to figure out what the link is. Another question is how do galaxies go from star forming to quiescent? Currently, there are many competing theories for this. Uh, one of them could be that a violent merger could shut down star formation in a galaxy altogether. Another thing could be that uh, winds that come from exploding supernovae or other mechanisms like supermassive black holes could drive out all the gas from a galaxy and leave it no fuel to form new galaxy, uh, new stars with. Another theory is instead of winds, it could just be a lot of energy that comes from these explosions that heats up all the gas in a galaxy and does it, uh, doesn't allow it to cool and form stars. So we need both uh, better observations to constrain this. And the true answer is going to likely be some combination of all of these factors, but figuring that out is going to be really interesting. Uh, it could also be something completely unexplored so far. So there's always new exciting science that may come up with future obs observations. Maybe one day when we have telescopes that are good enough to resolve these distant galaxies, uh, we'll be able to see that they have structures that are completely different from what our current simulations are predicting. And that may just spark a new age of questioning. So a lot of people are excited about the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope because it's going to see to really high redshifts. And it's going to give us a lot of unprecedented high quality observations that uh, we can't just wait to get our hands on and study. Uh, a third unanswered question is, 
whether galaxies grow and stop forming stars uh, in a manner that goes from starts on the inside and goes outward or whether it starts on the outer edges and gradually goes in so this inside out versus outside in uh, scenarios are not poorly constrained in part because we don't have the resolution but in part because there's very varying predictions from the different theoretical models we currently have and the the best part is that none of these questions act in isolation they are all dependent on each other if we find out that the effect of the central black holes is important that could significantly influence what our theory is for how galaxies stop forming stars for example it could also influence whether uh if if the central supermassive black hole is important then that favors things that go from the inside out uh if it's not important then that might favor things that go from the outside in so all of these questions are related to each other and that also promotes crosstalk between uh different astronomers that uh specialize in different things or look at the same problem from different perspectives so uh there is a couple more questions so let me take those before i proceed further uh one is do you think the big bang was a white hole so honestly this is not something i'm qualified to answer uh there's an excellent video on the big bang in a in the first cosmos from your couch uh edition by mike reed uh so please look at that the second question is do you think white holes exist on the other side of a black hole again this is more of a cosmology question so i'm going to defer that to a cosmologist and there are a couple of really nice talks in the cosmos from your couch series that talk about this uh the third question is why are galaxies roughly all the same size so if i gave you the impression that galaxies are all of of the same size that is very much not the case galaxies can be vastly different in sizes from each other uh in fact there is a relation between the number of stars a galaxy has and what size it is so this is just called the size mass relation and uh, on this relation you see galaxies that are at the same redshift sometimes a uh, 100 to 1000 times bigger than other galaxies so there are tiny runt galaxies that are called dwarf galaxies uh and then there are these huge ellipticals or disk galaxies at high masses and they are at vastly different sizes from each other and the growth of galaxy sizes over time or along with increasing galaxy properties is also a very actively studied area of research all right so uh to cap all of these things off I want to show you a simulation of how a galaxy is forming from this huge computer simulation that has gravity, fluid dynamics, hydrodynamics to uh, simulate the sort of fluid motion of the gas, uh, magnetism and other things built into it. So so here you can see all the gas in the neighborhood of a galaxy. in the inset you can see the visible light the the light that's coming from the stars in the galaxy as it's forming there's a merger happening right there so i'm going to go back just a bit so you can see that this object is going to fall in and when it does it's going to merge and that sort of disrupts the galaxy for a while uh and so this is from the illustrious tng team uh and in fact you can play this video from from the very highest redshift so the the top panel shows the redshift and as the redshift decreases the universe grows older and initially there isn't much on that you would even call galaxy so you see that this is the the real size of whatever was in the center over there and if you think of this as just the galaxy then this scale is roughly so if the galaxy is a person this is roughly the scale of a block around it and then this is the scale of the entire city that it lives in so you can see that a lot of gas is flowing in along with a stellar component and when they merge that causes very violent dynamics and so you can see a merger happening right here and this is the disturbed irregular looking galaxies that we see uh 
So this is the disturbed irregular looking galaxies that we see at high redshifts. And then as we go to low redshifts, uh, the galaxies look more ordered. These views are showing things like the metal content, which shows the amount of heavy elements. And then this shows the gas velocity. So the regions of higher velocity correspond to flows, inflows of gas that are coming in. This is showing the youngest stars that are in this galaxy at the present time. And now as redshifts decrease even further, uh, you can see the galaxy starting to look more and more like a regular disk galaxy that we see in, in the universe at present day. And the overall halo structure, so the, the amount of uh, gas around it has also stabilized. You can see it starting to develop a rough disk. And over time, this comes and it stabilizes and it forms this really nice looking disk galaxy. All right, so while this is playing, I can look at a few more questions. Uh, one is, right, so one is, do you think the fact that galaxies that aren't producing stars anymore uh, look like hazy blobs rather than spirals has anything to do with its supermassive black hole losing angular momentum? So that's a really good question. Uh, the question was like, since, since galaxies that aren't forming stars, uh, look like tend to look like that sometimes. Is it does it have something to do with the central supermassive black hole? So we don't know that the the angular momentum of a black hole specifically has anything to do with uh, the overall galaxy because, like I said, the black hole is still uh, many thousands to millions of times smaller than its parent galaxy. But we do think that the feedback from material acids getting accreted onto the black hole could strongly affect how the galaxy looks. So that's one theory that's currently being uh, investigated. Another uh, possible theory is in the video that I just showed you for uh, these cosmological simulations, we see that when galaxies merge, that can be a very violent event. So if a galaxy has many mergers in a row, that could also destroy its smooth disky shape and make it look like this indistinct elliptical blob. Uh, okay. So with that, uh, I will show you that there's uh, a couple more talks. If, if this was interesting to you, there's a couple more talks related to both seeing the universe as a time machine and looking at how galaxies evolve along with an upcoming talk on uh, our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So all of these are part of the Cosmos from your couch series. So if this talk interests you, please check out these talks as well. And with that, I will conclude and I will take a couple more questions. So thank you everyone for tuning in, for listening. I hope you stay well. Uh, okay, so one question. How do you know if a galaxy has a red or a blue shift? Do you assume most galaxies have similar wavelengths or emissions? So this is a really good question. And what we do in practice is when we, uh, so the question is how do we figure out uh, what a galaxy's red shift or blue shift is in theory? So when we know the theoretical emission patterns for young, intermediate, and older stars, uh, obviously these, the intensity of any of these things can change when the number of stars of each type changes. But overall, a galaxy's full SED is going to be some combination of these, th of these things. So what we do is whenever we see a galaxy spectrum, we fit it for these three things simultaneously, along with an extra factor that accounts for a stretch in this wavelength direction. And that stretch, uh, so essentially as redshift increases, all of these things get both dimmer and more stretched out. And by figuring out how stretched out a galaxy spectrum is, we can tell what redshift it has. Uh, most galaxies have a redshift because of the expansion of the universe. 
except for maybe extremely nearby galaxies. And those are in things that I'm talking about. Uh, another question is, is the Milky Way considered a small galaxy compared to Andromeda? So the Milky Way currently has around uh, 300 billion stars. And uh, it's definitely compared to Andromeda, comparable to Andromeda, although that's a bit bigger. Uh, another question is, do globular clusters, so this, the Milky Way Andromeda comparison is also not something that I'm very knowledgeable about, because studying things about the Milky Way can be a bit difficult, because we are in it, and that complicates estimates of things like what its stellar mass is. So I'm going to leave that for uh, Dr. Gwen Ad's talk on the 30th. Uh, another question that's come up is, do globular clusters survive galaxy mergers? So globular clusters, uh, for people who are unfamiliar with the concept, are these small compact clusters of, uh, of stars that are found within galaxies. And it's an interesting question about whether they survive galaxy mergers or not, because galaxy mergers, depending on how they happen, can be uh, events that are extremely traumatic versus events that hardly disturb the galaxy at all. So if you imagine two disky galaxies merging, then it depends a lot on whether the second galaxy comes in from the top and hits the first disk or whether it comes edge on. Uh, it also depends on factors like whether the two disks are rotating in the same direction or whether they are, whether one disk is rotating in the opposite direction to the first one. So again, it's, it's an interesting question and I'm not sure if I have an answer off the top of my head. Are there any other questions? All right, so if that is all the questions, I can stay on for uh, maybe another five minutes to see if there are any questions. And good night to everyone. Thank you for attending. That's a different slide.